I'm going to fast forward for just a minute. What we used to call the ideal gas law in Gen Chem, we're now going to call the perfect gas law. So we use the, the word ideal in a couple of other places in PCHEM, and so oftentimes some textbook authors and some professors will call it the perfect gas law instead of the ideal gas law. But the same thing you learned back in the day, what is the perfect gas law? And again, I've got to keep remembering to use a lowercase p because I'm used to teaching this to the Gen Chem class and their textbook uses a capital P. So if I screw it up, please remind me. I really want to get this right. So PV equals NRT. So, and if you look at this, if you rearrange this all, so what's PV over NT equal to? R. And what's R called? Yeah, it's called the gas constant or the universal gas constant. Either way, it's a constant. And so if I have all these lovely conditions of a gas, how many moles, pressure, volume, and temperature, and I change some of them to some new pressure, volume, maybe even change the moles of gas and change the temperature, what should this ratio still come out to, though? It's just still equal to R. So P1, V1 over N1, T2 would equal P2, V2 over N2, T2. So because they're both equal to R, they're equal to each other. So. And that's pretty much the combined gas law. Oftentimes, you'll see the combined gas law reduced to leaving the number of moles out. But that assumes you keep the moles of gas constant. But if you ever add moles or subtract moles of gas, you know, remove some, then you'd keep it in there. But anything that remains constant, like if we didn't change the moles of gas, N1 would equal N2, and it would just cancel out of the equation anyways. And so basically, if you change the conditions on a gas, you got one initial set of conditions, and you change some of them, and like the question is, you know, what's the new volume, or what's the new pressure? This is what you use. Anything that remained the same, just cancel it out of the equation anyways, and plug in the rest. Now here's the deal. You, temperature has to be in units of what? Kelvin. Always, in the whole chapter again. But pressure and volume, take your pick. So I don't really care. <coughs> Any units, of, as long as you use the same units on both sides, totally work. OK. So Dalton's law of partial pressures. If I had a sealed vessel, a closed vessel here, so that had N2O2 and CO2 in it. Dalton's law of partial pressures would tell me that the total pressure inside that vessel would equal what? So yeah, all of their corresponding partial pressures added together. So in this case, PO2 plus PN2 plus PCO2. That was what the total pressure would be. And a partial pressure is just the part of the total pressure that a particular gas is responsible for. Okay, the corollary to this is, is that the partial pressure of any particular gas, and I'll use N2 as a specific example, is equal to this lovely thing times the total pressure. What is that? It's not a letter X, it's the Greek letter chi, but what does it represent? It's mole fraction. What's a mole fraction? How many moles out of the total moles? It's just the fraction of the moles that are N2 in this case. Now here's the deal. Mole fraction usually kind of throws a couple of students initially. It's the same thing as a percentage, except you don't multiply by 100 at the end, right? So notice, let's say I start doing this. Now let's go 14, 4, 2. I'll just put a bunch of moles of gas in there, specific amounts. What percentage of the moles are nitrogen. 70 percent. 70 percent. How'd you do that? 14 out of 20 and then times 100. Well, let's, let's just back that out now. Don't multiply by 100 this time. What would the mole fraction of N2 be? 0.7. It's just a decimal form of percentage, right? So it's really the same thing as a percentage. You're just not multiplying by 100. You're just leaving it as a fraction. And so in this case, I'm going to call, say that the total pressure inside this vessel is 50 atmospheres. And I want to know what the partial pressures of each gas are. And essentially what it says, you know, what this lovely second formula here says, is it just says if a gas is, you know, responsible for 7 tenths or 70 percent of the moles of gas, then it's responsible for also 70% of the total pressure as well. That's all it means. And so in this case, so your PN2 would equal 14 out of 20 is the mole fraction times the total pressure of 50 atmospheres 
and what do we get? What is 70% of 50? 35 atmospheres. We can do the same thing for O2. What would the partial pressure of O2 be equal to? What's the mole fraction? Four out of 20. What percentage is that? Yeah, 20%. Then it's responsible for 20% of the total pressure. So mole fraction here is 0.2, though. And what do we get? Cool. And I could do the same thing for CO2, but I can probably really quickly already know what CO2 is. What is the partial pressure of CO2? And how did we do that so quickly? <coughs> yeah, they all got a total up to 50. And so PCO2 had to be 5. And again, we could have done the same thing. It's mole fractions 2 out of 20 moles times the total pressure. But if you got the last one left, just it has to balance the rest out, right? That's all Dalton's law of partial pressure says. His law specifically is just the total pressure is the sum of all the partial pressures. But this little corollary usually gets grouped in with it. A partial pressure of any gas is equal to the mole fraction times the total pressure. Cool. That's all it is. And again, that's review from Gen Chem.